Hey everybody, welcome to day 66 of our Bible in a Year Plus podcast. I am very glad to be with you again today. Today we're looking at Deuteronomy 25 through 27, especially when we get to chapter 27, we're going to have a little emphasis. I once heard a former prisoner talking about being in a penitentiary where he had become a Christian and he was in a Bible study and the Bible study was on Deuteronomy chapters 27 and 28 and he was taught what he considered to be life-changing. He says, you know, that's it. He suddenly realized, that's it. Our problem as prisoners is that we have all been living our lives under generational curses and all the curses described in Deuteronomy 27 and 28. And that's why we're so broken and miserable in life. And he said that this realization captured the imagination of other prisoners and uh, his fellow inmates had their lives changed as well from this little quasi revival in their prison Bible study. Now the conclusions of these prisoners that day were not all bad. They had the right idea, but they just need a little calibration. And so uh, today we're going to talk about that and recalibrate just a little bit. Uh, the topic of blessings and curses in the Mosaic Law for the Old Testament Israelites. We'll be looking at Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 1 from the King James Version of the Bible with updated vocabulary, but you can follow along in another version if you prefer. Deuteronomy 25.1. If there's a controversy between men and they come to judgment that the judges may judge them, then they shall justify the righteous and condemn the wicked. And it shall be if the wicked man is worthy to be beaten that the judge shall cause him to lie down and to be beaten before his face according to his fault by a certain number. Forty stripes he may give him and not exceed, lest if he should exceed and beat him above these with many stripes, then your brother should seem vile to you. You shall not muzzle the ox when he treads out the grain. If brothers live together and one of them die and has no child, and the wife of the dead shall not marry outside to a stranger, her husband's brother shall go in to her and take her to him to be a wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. And it shall be that the firstborn which she bears shall succeed in the name of his brother who has died, that his name will not be put out in Israel. And if the brother does not like to take his brother's wife, then let his brother's wife go up to the gate to the elders and say, my husband's brother refuses to raise up to his brother a name in Israel. He will not perform the duty of my husband's brother. Then the husbands of, uh, then the elders of his city shall call him and speak to him. And if he stands by it and says, I do not want to take her, then his brother's wife shall come to him in the presence of the elders and remove his shoe from off his foot and spit in his face. And she'll answer and say, so shall it be done to the man that will not build up his brother's house. And his name shall be called in Israel, the house of him who has his shoe removed. When men strive together, one with another, and the wife of the one draws near to deliver her husband out of the hand of him who strikes him, and puts forth her hand and takes him by the privates, then you shall cut off her hand. Your eyes shall not pity her. You shall not have in your bag differing weights, a great and a small. You shall not have in your house differing measures, a great and a small, but you shall have a perfect and just weight, a perfect and just measure you shall have, that your days may be lengthened in the land which the Lord your God gives you. For all who do such things and all that do unrighteously are an abomination to the Lord your God. Remember what Amalek did to you by the road when you had come forth out of Egypt, how he met you by the road and, and struck down the hindmost among you, even all that were feeble behind you when you were faint and weary, and he did not fear God. Therefore it shall be, when the Lord your God has given you rest from all your enemies round about in the land which the Lord your God gives you for an inheritance to possess it, that you shall blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. You shall not forget it. Chapter 26. And it shall be when you are come into the land which the Lord your God gives you for an inheritance and possess and, and dwell in it, 
that you shall take from the first of all the fruit of the earth, which you shall bring from the land that the Lord your God gives you, and shall put it in a basket, and shall go to the place which the Lord your God shall choose to place his name there, and shall go into the priest that shall be in those days, and say to him, I profess this day unto the Lord your God that I have come into the country which the Lord swore to our fathers to give it to us. And the priest shall take the basket out of your hand and set it down before the altar of the Lord your God. And you shall speak and say before the Lord your God, A Syrian, ready to perish, was my father. And he went down into Egypt and sojourned there with a few and became there a nation, great, mighty, and populous. And the Egyptians treated us evilly and afflicted us and laid upon us hard bondage. And when we cried to the Lord God of our fathers, the Lord heard our voice and looked on our affliction and our labor and our oppression. And the Lord brought us forth out of Egypt with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm and with great fearsomeness and with signs and with wonders. And he has brought us into this place and has given us this land, even a land that flows with milk and honey. And now see, I have brought the first fruits of the land which you, O Lord, have given me. And you shall set these before the Lord your God and worship before the Lord your God. And you shall rejoice in every good thing which the Lord your God has given into you and unto your house and the Levite and the stranger who is among you. When you have made an end of tithing all the tithes of your increase in the third year, which is the year of tithing, and have given it to the Levite, the stranger, the orphan, and the widow, who uh, that they may eat within your gates and be filled, then you shall say before the Lord your God, I have brought away the separated things out of my house, and also have given them to the Levite and to the orphan and the stranger and the widow, according to all your commandments which you have commanded me. I have not transgressed your commandments, neither have I forgotten them. I have not eaten of it in my mourning, neither have I taken away anything of it for any unclean use, nor given any of it for the dead. But I have listened to the voice of the Lord my God, and have done according to all that you commanded commanded me. Look down from your holy habitation from heaven and bless your people Israel and the land which you have given us as you swore to our fathers, a land that flows with milk and honey. This day the Lord your God has commanded you to do these statutes and judgments. Thou shalt therefore keep and do them with all your heart and with all your soul. You have certified to the Lord this day to be your God, to walk in his ways and to keep his statutes and his commandments and his judgments and to listen to his voice. And the Lord has certified to you this day to be his particular people as he has promised you and that you should keep all his commandments and to make you high above all nations which he has made in praise and in name and in honor and that you may be a holy people to the Lord your God as he has spoken. Chapter 27. And Moses, with the elders of Israel, commanded the people, saying, Keep all the commandments which I command you this day. And it shall be on the day when you pass over Jordan unto the land which the Lord your God gives you, that you shall set up great stones and plaster them with plaster, and you shall write upon them all the words of this law when you are passed over, that you may go into the land which the Lord your God gives you, a land flowing with milk and honey, as the Lord God of your fathers has promised you. Therefore, it shall be when you have gone over Jordan, that you shall set up these stones, which I command you this day, in Mount Ebal, and you shall plaster them with plaster. And there you shall build an altar to the Lord your God, an altar of stones. You shall not lift up any iron tool upon them. You shall build the altar of the Lord your God of whole stones, and you shall offer burnt offerings on it to the Lord your God. And you shall offer peace offerings, and shall eat there, and rejoice before the Lord your God. And you shall write upon the stones all the words of this law very plainly. And Moses and the priests, the Levites, spoke to all Israel, saying, Take heed and listen, O Israel. This day you have become the people of the Lord your God. You shall therefore obey the voice of the Lord your God and do his commandments and his statutes, which I command you this day. And Moses charged the people the same day, saying, These shall stand upon Mount Gerizim to bless the people when you have come over Jordan, Simeon and Levi, Judah and Issachar, Joseph and Benjamin. 
and these shall stand upon Mount Ebal to curse. Reuben, Gad, Asher, Zebulun, Dan, and Naphtali. And the Levites shall speak and say to all the men of Israel with a loud voice, Cursed is the man who makes any engraved or molten image an abomination unto the Lord, the work of the hands of the craftsmen, and puts it in a secret place. And all the people shall answer and say, Amen. Cursed is he who takes lightly his father or his mother, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed is he who removes his neighbor's landmark, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed is he who makes the blind to wander out of the road, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed is he who perverts the judgment of the stranger, the orphan, and the widow, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed is he who lies with his father's wife because he has uncovered his father's skirt, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed is he who lies with any kind of animal, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed is he who lies with his sister, the daughter of his father, or the daughter of his mother, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed is he who lies with his mother-in-law, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed is he who smites his neighbor secretly, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed is he who takes reward to kill an innocent person, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed is he who confirms not all the words of this law to do them, and all the people shall say, Amen. And this ends Deuteronomy chapter 27. All right, a couple quick things, then we want to talk about these blessings and curses. In chapter 25, verses 5 through 10, you probably were intrigued, maybe a little amused, at the law concerning leveret marriage. That is, when a young widow has a husband who dies, and there is a brother who could come and take her as his second wife and raise up a firstborn child to take over the family estate. But then the fellow in our scenario doesn't want to marry his brother's widow. So in Leverett marriage, the idea was uh, with the shoe that uh, you would go over to your brother's widow's property, your brother's former property, now he has deceased. You'd go to your brother's widow's property and you'd stand on that property with your feet and you'd say, from now on, this is my property. I take ownership of it and I am going to help my brother's widow have an estate. And so that's what he should do. But in our scenario, he doesn't want to. And so the widow takes her brother-in-law before the elders of the city and says, my brother-in-law, won't marry me and help me raise up a firstborn child so that we have a family estate. And that's wicked. And the elders will say, is that so? And if he stands by and says, yeah, I don't want to marry her. Then the young widow takes the shoe off of her brother-in-law, removes the shoe from his foot, and she spits in his face and she says, this is the way it is for someone who won't even bother to raise up a firstborn child to take over our family inheritance. And you say, well, what's the deal with the shoe then? What's the deal with the sandal? And the idea is his, the brother-in-law's feet should have stood on her property to say, I claim this property for my brother, but he wouldn't do it. So now the sandal that should have been on that property is removed from his foot. And, and the, the people would say, oh yeah, yeah, he, he was one. He, he wouldn't stand on his brother's property and raise up an estate for his brother. He's a bad guy. And since it's a, a matter of standing on the property, then the shoe is the symbol. You wouldn't even have your shoe on my property like it should be. So she takes the shoe and she keeps it. And he is now the person who didn't even bother to help his brother and his brother's widow to raise up a son. So that's the symbolism of it all. In chapter 27, verses 12 through 13, you see that there is going to be this special ceremony. And Moses can't go, right? Because this is going to be on the left-hand side. This is going to be on the west side of the Jordan River. And, and Moses isn't going to be allowed to go on that side of the Jordan River. 
But Moses is describing the ceremony. He says, here's what's going to happen. We're going to have the Levites on that side of the Jordan. They're going to have their backs to the Mediterranean Sea, about halfway up, by the way, halfway up the Jordan River between the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea. So halfway up. And the Levites are going to face the Jordan River, their backs to the Mediterranean Sea. On the left-hand side is going to be Mount Ebal. On the right-hand side, Mount Gerizim. And half of the children of Israel, six tribes, are going to be on Mount Ebal and other six tribes on Mount Gerizim. And the Levites are going to shout out the laws. And all the people are going to say, Amen. And so that's what's happening here. The, the people are going to line up on the two opposite hillsides. And the Levites are going to say the laws. And the people are going to say, Amen. And on one side, it represents the blessings. On the other side, the cursings. So that's what's going on. So in chapters 27 and 28, 28 we come to next time. But in chapters 27 and 28, you see the curses and the blessings. The curses come in two parts. First of all, chapter 27 has the curses. And then the opening of chapter 28 has the blessings. And then the second half of 28 has more curses. So the curses form bookends to the middle part, which is the blessing. All right. Now, we have to understand what's going on here. Remember in our opening illustration, the prisoners doing the Bible study on the blessings and curses in Deuteronomy 27, 28 said, that's it. That's what's wrong with us. We are living under the curse. And uh, that's, that explains why our finances never work out and our enemies have hurt us. And here we are in captivity, just like the curses said would happen. All that they said would happen is happening to me. We're living under the curse. That's it. Well, that's not quite right. Because remember that this is specifically for Old Testament Israel. This is the Mosaic Covenant for Israelites before the New Covenant, the New Covenant being when Jesus died on the cross. All right, so, but the idea is still there. And it's good for us as we read these blessings and curses to realize that if we obey the Lord, good things tend to happen to us. And if we disobey the Lord, bad things tend to happen to us. So in Moses' day, it was causation. If you will obey the Lord, these good things will happen. If you disobey the Lord, these bad things will happen. It was direct cause. For us, it's not direct cause. This is not our promise, and these are not our threats. But what we should do is see the pattern. And as we've said other times, respect the pattern. You see how God thinks. And so in Moses' day, if you reach a critical mass of obedient Israelites, good things happen. If you have a critical mass of disobedient Israelites, bad things happen. And you can't just have one guy. So, for example, Isaiah was a wonderful Israelite, but he wasn't a critical mass. He's just one guy. So what happens to him? Wicked king Manasseh puts him inside a hollow log and cuts him in half. He was a wonderful Israelite, a wonderful prophet, but bad things happened. It's not that one person is going to be good. It's that you have to reach a critical mass of Israelites who are going to be good, and then good things happen. So you see how it works? And yet there is still importance here. Um, we should look at all of these things. We will bless the Lord and, and, and be honest and, and have a heart of integrity and obey Him. And if we do these things, good things tend to happen. So here's how we should approach these things. Uh, we should say, look, the Israelites had a genius God who deeply cared for them. And this genius God said that they should not touch a dead body. And, and maybe if that's what he thought was good for them, maybe we should respect the pattern. Maybe we should be pretty careful about touching dead bodies. And this genius God said that um, they shouldn't work seven days a week. Now, it's not a law to us, and there are no guarantees. But if he thought it wasn't a good idea for the people he loved to work seven days a week, maybe we shouldn't work seven days a week. And this genius God said that they should stay away from feces, you know, bury that stuff, don't, don't get around it. And if that's what he thought for his people, uh, you know, not that there's any rule about this for us, but if that's what he thought, we should respect the pattern, and maybe we should make sure that we stay away from all that germy stuff. You see, you keep doing that. Uh, the genius God who really loved his people, he said, don't move the ancient landmarks. 
you know, private property. So if he thought that, then maybe we shouldn't be communists. Maybe we should cherish private property and never mess with the borderlines. It's sort of sacred. Uh, maybe that's how we should think. You see, it's not a law. We can be communists if we want to. It's not a law. But if that's what God thinks, maybe we should respect the pattern. And you do it with quarantining sick people. Oh, if that's what he thought was a good idea, respect the pattern. Maybe we should quarantine sick people. And uh, if, if he thought that false prophecy, incorrect prophecies were a matter of life and death, then we should respect the pattern. Maybe we should make sure we don't have incorrect prophecies. We don't tolerate that. If he thought that there shouldn't be prison for crimes, but there should be fines and even servitude, then maybe that would be a good idea for any nation to look at it. Let's not have prisons. Let's have people pay fines. And if they can't pay the fines, then they work on farms until they've paid off their debt. Maybe that's better. And capital crime, right, for murderers, because God thought it was a good idea. He's a genius. He loved his people. So maybe we should respect the pattern. And you can do that with significant money. Oh, those Old Testament people, uh, they gave quite a lot of money. You know, they had the one year tithe and then the, another tithe in the every three years. And then they also gave all their firstborn uh, animals to the Lord. And then there were burned offerings whenever they want to. They gave quite a lot of money to the Lord. Maybe we should give quite a lot of money to the Lord. Maybe we should respect the pattern. You see, uh, they didn't have any alcohol at all. If they had a Nazarite vow or if they were priests on duty, alcohol must be dangerous. We should respect the pattern. You see? And so it's not a law to us. It's not causation. If you have a critical mass of people, then this is what will happen. It's not causation, but it's correlation. We know how God thinks. So does that make sense to you? Well, that, of course, is our big life lesson of the day. Even though we corporately are never guaranteed prosperity, if a critical mass of people in our family, in our church, in our nation obey the Lord, and we're not guaranteed hardship if a critical mass of people in our family, in our church, in our nation disobey the Lord, there are no guarantees here for us. It was only for the Israelites. It was their covenant, and we're not in that covenant. Even though there's no guarantee, we should respect the pattern. So I think that should be our prayer, don't you? That we will commit to respecting the pattern. Like, okay, Lord, we see you. We see what you have in mind. And uh, we want to be a delight to you, again, because we think you're super intelligent and super loving. So we're going to follow you. We will respect the pattern. All right? So will you pray that in your heart as I pray it out loud? Father God, it's true. We look and we see you. We see the pattern. And today we want to say that we are going to respect the pattern. We know there are no guarantees if we are obedient, but we're going to respect the pattern because we think you are a super genius and you are super loving. So we commit to you to respect the pattern that you showed us in the Old Testament. And we commit this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, okay. Again, thank you for joining us for day 66 of our Bible in a Year Plus podcast, and I sure hope I get to see you again tomorrow. Bye-bye.